You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers about hikers for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. You're listening to Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. And I'm your host, Mighty Blue, or Steve Adams. We're up to episode number 372 today with the son of a previous guest sharing his story. Emily Leonard, who I met last year at Trail Days along with her husband Bruce, was on the show last year and she suggested I might want to reach out to her son, Patrick, or Patch. So it's Patch Leonard, who is this week's guest, and we'll be meeting him shortly. I should point out before we really get into it that we've had all sorts of technical snafus this week. So some of the sound isn't as good as I'd like, but with hours of editing, (laughs) and I mean hours, I've done my best to make everybody sound as good as I can. After Patch, I'm happy to report that all three of our Mighty Blue class of 23 participants this week are still on the trail. (laughs) At least they were when I last heard. First up will be Betty McEnany. I met Betty at our Woods Hole weekend back in October last year and I was impressed with her quiet determination to get this done. Interestingly, Betty brought her husband Bruce along with her to share the weekend and, we hope, to allay some of the concerns that he may have had before she headed out. Well, she's loving it. Though, as you'll hear, she faced a big issue this week, which we're going to get into. Then, Brian Robbins will be back on. If you recall, when we last spoke with Brian, he was just about to get started at Amicalola. He had a bit of a funny start as he had to go back home after a couple of days to officially retire. But he's back on and looking forward to the Smokies. And the last member of our class of 23 today is Mary Marks and her dog, Wiley. I also met Mary and Wiley at the Woods Hole weekend and she's another woman just getting on with it. And she says she may be slow, but she's loving and treasuring every moment out there. Our class of 23 will be on after Patch. To close up today, George Stefanos finally closes the book on Crazy Charlie and whether or not is a yellow blazer, as we would say now. Oh, and just before we start and meet Pax Leonard, I had an email from Maura Conlon this week who suggested I get a veterinarian on the show, preferably someone who's also a hiker, who'll be able to give us some of the science and the best advice on taking your dog with you on a hike. So, here's your chance if you're a hiking vet. Drop me a line at steve at hikingradionetwork.com and I'll set up a call to record. So now let's hear from Patch Leonard. Here's Patch, or Cold Brew. Our guest today is the son of a previous guest. That guest was, or is, Emily Leonard, or Black Bear, and she was on the show last summer. But this is her son, Patch Leonard, or Cold Brew. Hey, Patch, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, Steve, thanks for having me. Well, good to talk to you. Um, I don't think we've done this before. I had a, a... a son and mother on the show or um, separate times. And and we spoke a few weeks ago, but I didn't really work out the story in the way that I normally do. And I probably shouldn't tell you this. So of course I got in contact with your mum yeah. <laughs> and she helped me out with a few points. So if you don't like the questions, blame her. <laughs> okay. All right. So, let, so let's get started by you telling us a little bit about yourself. How old are you, Patch? Um, 26. I'll be 27 in a month. All right. So did you go to college? Yeah, I went to college right out of high school. I got my bachelor's in mechanical engineering. Right. And, uh, and I've got to ask, I've got to ask about your extracurricular activities. When I realized what that was, it was to do with football. So tell us about that. Yeah. So I, I played division one football at the university of Maine. Uh-huh. I played soccer my whole life. Uh, right up until or from when I was about four through halfway through high school Mm -hmm. and then I got enticed to swap over to football because they needed a kicker (laughs) and that worked out in my favor because then I ended up going to play college ball so oh really oh wow so was that do you have any chance the pros or anything like that no no shot at that but uh just being on the team itself was a great great life experience 
I bet it was. That's interesting. That made you part of a team. And it, it's the thing I miss most about when I had to quit soccer back when I was about 35 years old. I was obviously getting a bit too old for it at the time. And my, my work suggested it'd be a good idea I quit because I'm probably going to get injured. And uh, so did you learn much from playing um, playing as a kicker as part of a team that perhaps even helped you for hiking the AT? Never really thought about that, but probably did. I mean, uh, there's definitely a big camaraderie aspect of being on a college team. I mean, I bet. a lot bigger than high school sports. I mean, you're spending hours and hours with your other teammates. Yeah. Whether it's yeah. On practice or lifts or just uh, – studying together and traveling so the hiking i know i know your mum lives in maine and i think you live in you live in new hampshire is that right yeah i'm in new hampshire i've been here for almost three years now right right and so obviously you've got hiking on your back door so when did you actually get into hiking in the first place then well, i get into hiking fairly young uh, i grew up hunting and fishing mostly right the first hike that i can recall uh, was when i was about 12 uh my family and I, we had Katahdin, did a day hike of that. That was your first first uh, proper hike. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm sure I did smaller ones, but that's the, the first one I can remember when I was young. And then after that, uh, didn't do a ton. Maybe I would guess once or twice a year, maybe do a small hike. Right. Uh, but I didn't really get into it until I moved here after college. And was that after your mother um, did her through hike? Yeah, that was after that. So I moved here to New Hampshire uh, about a year after I graduated college. Right. And so did you ever consider hiking the trail with your mum when she went, or was that not really on your radar at the time? No, not a chance. I, I, <laughs> even even after she had hiked, I had people ask me if I was ever interested in, in hiking the AT myself. And at that time, there was, it was it wasn't even a – a thought for me. It wasn't something I was interested in. Well, what changed? Because clearly something changed because you went and, get, went and did it. So what actually what actually happened? Well, I moved here, obviously, and I got all these these beautiful mountains right in my back door. So I, I started hiking all the time and kind of just fell in love with it right away. Um, and I did my first proper proper backpacking trip in the fall of 2020. And I think that was when I first stuck the idea in my head that I'd like to through hike it through hike the whole trail. So would your mother have liked you would you think do you think your mother would have liked you to come with you? With her rather? Uh probably. Yeah. She loves spending time with, with me and my brothers. So if, if yeah, I had sure. offered to come with her, I'm sure she would have loved that. So you decided you wanted it yourself. You you got you know, you got this perfect playground, as it were, in in your backyard to go and try the mountains out. And but you were married. Were you actually married at the time you thought about this? I know you're married now. Were you were you uh, married then? Not when I decided. Uh, I got married in 2021. All right. Uh, we were originally going to get married in 2020. So sure. yeah, I mean, I was I've been with my wife for quite a while. So she's she's been a, a part of the whole the whole process with me. Well, tell us that then. So you decided you got married in 21. You. You, you were with her anyway in that case when you decided you wanted to do this. Did she want to come with you or did was that not an option for her? No, definitely not. She's uh she enjoys hiking, but not not nearly to the extent that I do. <laughs> well, clearly not. <laughs> and and was she supportive though of you wanting to do that? Because this is a very early stage of whatever I mean actually what what career actually are you in or were you in? I was a manufacturing engineer. Okay. So you've got the degree, you've got the, en- an en- is that an engineering degree? Yeah, my degree is in mechanical engineering and I was a manufacturing engineer. Well, of course, engineers can go and work anywhere. So you had no problem with that then. So I presume you had to quit your job then, did you? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I, I tried to go for a leave of absence so I could go, so I could return after the trail, but that didn't work out. So I just, I left and set off on the trail. <laughs> so talk me through that conversation then with your wife. How did that work out? She was very supportive, right? Right from the first time I mentioned to her that I thought about through hiking, she didn't even question. She, she, she just said, yeah, I think you should do it. All right. And what about your, your folks, uh, Emily and Bruce? Were they quite supportive? Oh, yeah, definitely. They were extremely excited for me. 
<laughs> I'm sure they were. Especially my mom since she since she had ached already. Yeah. And one of the things I got from your mother when she when we uh, communicated about this, um, it was really how you trained and prepared for your hike. You did the, all the New Hampshire 48, 4,000 footers twice. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that t- that takes some commitment. You, you must have been out there virtually every weekend, weren't you? Yeah, just about. So I mean, when I moved here, I started picking them off every now and then. Uh, and eventually I hiked. I hiked them in a, about a year or so after I moved here. And then um, when the winter was, was approaching for or the winter before I set out on my through hike, I, and I wanted something to keep busy throughout the winter. So I set a goal to hike all the 4,000 footers in the winter season. So wow. starting on the December 21st or whatever date the solstice was and completing them before the spring solstice in March. And I ended up, I hiked them all in about two months. I finished that in February that year. Well, so talk to us about the weather at the time then, because from, from memory, the, uh, the winter isn't a great time to be hiking in New Hampshire. Yeah, no, and, and uh, that winter was particularly cold. I lost track of how many mornings I went out. I mean, before the sun came up, uh, get a nice early start, just because that's what I like to do. And the the ambient temperature, not even including the wind chill, was 20 below. You know what, though, that must have been even. I mean, these were just day hikes. Just day hikes. These were day hikes, I presume, were they? Yeah, just day hikes. Right, right. You must have you must have gained quite a bit from that in terms of dealing with the cold weather. Tell us how that helped you in your preparation for the AT. Um, yeah, I mean, the cold has never really bothered me uh, growing up in Maine and recreating all winter long, but for for hiking throughout the winter last year, I'm not sure how I would say it prepared me for for hiking the AT. But just aside from the keeping up my physical side of it, uh, just hiking sure. every every weekend. But as far as the cold, uh, I'm not sure if that played a part or not. And you were, and one of the things your mother said that you hiked, you hiked most of the AT in shorts and a tank top. I presume you didn't do that when you were doing the 4,000 footers. No, yeah, definitely not shorts and tank top weather in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> it made me recall a couple of days that where it was warm enough to, to shed off a layer and be out in a t shirt, but maybe once or twice. God damn me, sounds awful to me. So you <laughs> set off from, from Springer. Did you start alone or did you go with a buddy? So I started with my brother. He took some vacation, mm-hmm. and he hiked the first week with me. Mm-hmm. And all my my whole family came down. So my my dad, my mom, and my right. wife came down right. Uh, right. to set off from Amicalola. And then my <laughs> wife exciting. camped out on top of Springer with me the first night. Right, right. So how did you feel leaving them behind, leaving her behind? Or, and or did you see her, see her regularly during the during the hike? No, I didn't see her for about three months, the first three months. So okay. it, it was a little sad leaving her because we hadn't been apart from each other for, I want to say, like more than a week and a half or two weeks before that. So Sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, knowing Emily, and I've, I met her obviously at Trail Days, I'm surprised she didn't want to come with you. <laughs> didn't just say to Bruce, right, I, I'm going to go with the guys and see how it goes. <laughs> so yeah, I uh, think she did want to come, but she wanted to, uh, <laughs> to have my own have my own hike. Quite right too. <laughs> and so you you headed out with your brother. So how far did the two of you get in that first week? Was it a week or two weeks? You said you were with him. Uh, it was about a week, maybe maybe eight days or so. I can't remember the exact number of days, but we made it to Franklin. Oh, did you? Oh, that's pretty pretty good going then. And. Yeah. Um, did, did he enjoy it? Was it, or was he, you know, his thing was only ever going to be eight days? Oh yeah, he had a lot of fun. He he definitely enjoyed it. Um, and once he and once he left, did your hike change? Because this, and we've talked about this a lot recently about how it's so different hiking with somebody as opposed to hiking by yourself. Did you notice that difference once he'd gone? Yeah, definitely. Um, I I definitely enjoyed having him out, but I was also looking forward to to being on my own once. Once we parted ways, right? And did you get into it straight away? I mean, you know, it's a, 
it's sometimes a bit, I, I think with the preparation you had, you were probably, I presume you were physically prepared and possibly even mentally prepared. Did you get into the rhythm of your hike straight away? Oh, yeah. Yeah, right from day one, honestly, I was, you know, I fell in love with the the whole through hiking routine right on day one. So what do you get out of it then? What what what, what does through hiking do for you in terms of, um, is it the challenge? Is it the... Is it the solitude or is it a bunch of different things? I think it's a mix of everything. I definitely like the athletic aspect to it. I mean, once I finished yeah. football, I wasn't really into anything athletic except for just going to the gym. So right. being able to to challenge myself physically was a huge part of it. And also the, right. the mental side, just kind of you get to clear your head out there when you're just doing the same thing day after day. Did you ever get bored? Yeah, maybe sometimes. Not very often, though. Uh, I, th- I think just in the – maybe in the mid-Atlantic, I started to get a little bored when the, the scenery isn't as exciting as it is in the mountains down south. And certainly not as exciting as the mountains up north either. Right. And your trail name, Cold Brew, I know that you're <laughs> – apparently your mother wanted you to be called Yukon Cornelius. God knows why I saw that. Um, and it might have been a bit of a mouthful for your fellow hikers. How do you yeah. settle on Cold Brew? Yeah, so I didn't I didn't even get that trail name until New Hampshire, I think. You already know that I, I go by Patch mostly. Yeah, which yeah. Is it's, how Patrick. I it's Patrick, yeah. Right, short for Patrick. Which is yeah. so I introduced myself as Patch when I met other hikers down south, and everyone just yeah. assumed that was my trail name. So right. I ended up never getting a trail name until, <laughs> I, until I was in New Hampshire. I reconnected with a hiker I met in Virginia, and we we were hiking together for a while, and we got to talking, and he he wanted to help me come up with a, an actual trail name for myself. So I I'm a big coffee drinker, and. Uh-huh especially cold brew when it's nice and hot out it's good to have a ice cold cold brew coffee to cool down so we ended up settling on that okay well you know what it, I, I think patch would be a great one anyway to be honest with you patch itself was, i i didn't realize that it was short for patrick which shows how dumb i am i guess um right. and tell us about the four state challenge now i know people do this and, and especially the youngsters like like to do this as well why did you want to have a go at it? Well, firstly, tell people what it is and then tell us tell us about it, how, how it went. Yeah, so the four-state challenge, for, for those that don't know, uh, you go through four states in one day, and it's about 44 or 45 miles. So you start yeah. at the Virginia, West Virginia border. You yeah. do the four-ish miles through West Virginia, Harpers Ferry. And you cross into Maryland, and you do all of Maryland, and you finish at the mason dixon line at the pennsylvania border so me and my hiking partner uh, Stubbs was his trail name mm-hmm. we decided we wanted to try to tackle that and for me it was the challenge of it i wanted to to change things up give myself a challenge to see if i could see if i could complete it and also see how see how fast i could do it in because I, I didn't really doubt that i couldn't do it <laughs> Um, I would have totally doubted I couldn't do it, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, by now, then you're you're already pounding out the miles, I presume. So yeah. So it wasn't it wasn't the, it wasn't the difficulty of the forty miles. It was the staying awake, or what was it that was the challenge to you then? I think the challenge was just the heat. Um, I started pretty early, around three thirty or four in the morning, whereas yeah, as cool as it could be for July or whenever it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, once the once the sun came up and the got into the heat of the day, it just sucks the energy right out of you. Sure, sure. But luckily, that was when my parents had come down to visit me, so they they slack backed me through the whole thing, so I was able to do a little bit of trail running through it. Oh God! <laughs> How long did it take you then? Uh, Sixteen hours to do forty-two miles. Was it forty? Is it forty-two or forty-four? Forty. I think official eighteen miles is a little over forty-four, but I had made a a wrong turn, like first thing in the morning, you did like an extra mile. Oh. <laughs> oh there were, yeah, a little heads up for people. Before you get to Harper's Ferry, there's some light blue blazes that if you're in the dark, your headlamp might make them look white. So, 
Oh dear me! Oh dear! Me. Yeah. That's not the best. The best thing to do on the four on the four state challenge and the get lost in the first no. hour, is it really? Yeah, no. it was a little bit of a setback, but got through it. And, and this I hardly believe. Your mother told me that you didn't actually lose any weight on the trail. Is that right? Yeah, I weighed just about the same I did as when I set off. How did you manage that? Eat everything. Everything you see. <laughs> my my food bag normally for for a stretch would be, I don't know, if I had to guess, at least three pounds of food a day, maybe more. I had a hard time not packing too much food, but I always seemed to eat everything no matter what. And then definitely make up calories when you get into town too. Eat as much eat as much as you can in town. That is absolutely not explaining how you didn't lose any weight though. <laughs> I mean, was, were you doing some trail running quite a bit at the time? Uh, on trail or before before the AT? But no, I mean on, on the on trail itself. Because if you if you've gone that if you're burning so many calories in a day, I can see how you know you, you're going to lose weight. Or do you not burn the calories? No, oh, I definitely burn the calories. Um, I've always had a high metabolism, so I think that definitely fed into it a little bit. Uh, I did do a some trail running, but not very often. So you were managed because, <laughs> as I say, an average adult um, male burns between five and seven thousand calories a day on the trail. You were able to put in five to seven thousand calories of food a day, were you? Yeah, I, I counted a, a few times on on trail how many calories I was eating, and I was definitely around the six to seven thousand mark. Oh my god! What was your favorite then? What was your favorite meal on trail? Uh, my favorite dinner is the. It's probably the good to go dehydrated meals. It's the their Cuban rice bowl. So that that alone was about a, a eleven hundred calorie meal. And almost every time I would at least add some pepperoni and cheese or whatever to it. So did you so did you get hiker hunger or do you, were you eating the food because you like food and because you wanted to keep your weight at a, at a level? Because I've never heard anybody do this hike, any guy anyway, do this hike without losing, losing quite a considerable amount of weight. Yeah, I think I was born with hiker hunger, honestly. <laughs> um, I, don't know, I started eating what people would consider to have hiker hunger from the beginning. I remember getting to uh, Hiawassee, that first trail, or not the first trail town, uh, one of the first towns, and just yeah. absolutely crushing a large amount of food at the brewery there <laughs> you know the problem with that of course is when you get back home most people don't stop eating they still keep eat, 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 eating large did you put on weight when you got back home then no i haven't um i made a point to get straight back to the gym when i got home which was something i missed while i was out there wow. so I, i've managed to stay in pretty good shape since i've been home that is incredibly disciplined of you it really is so how long did the um hike actually take you just over four and a half months. It was 137 days, I believe. Uh, that's moving. And did you pick up any injuries on the way? Yeah, I did, actually. I had a handful. Uh, my original goal was to do the trail in about four months, but some of the injuries right. ended up slowing me down a little bit. I had an injury before I started the trail, which I think I developed over the winter when I was doing my my training for the wintertime uh, right. on my knee. Just some sort of overuse injury with my knee. Uh, and that, that healed up mostly for me, good enough yeah. for where I could start on the trail. Uh, but then my first injury actually on the trail, I strained my quad coming off of Chestnut Knob All right. here in Virginia. Yeah, I know it will. Yeah. Um, and it was to the point where I was actually limping down the trail because I, I pulled it so bad. Hmm. And uh, I can't remember what time. It was It was later in the evening. Um, yeah. And I was going to be coming up to a road soon, which which was good because there wasn't any good camping spots and it was somewhat of a dry stretch. And I called uh, a hostel and they were able to pick me up in in a couple miles or so, which which kind of right, saved right. me that day. Sure. So did you take some time off the trail to to get it better? Uh, not a ton. I I more so just slowed myself down. Um, I did take one full day off at weary feet hostel All right and that in conjunction with a with a couple of slower days i was able to heal up pretty good and going so fast on the trail uh, I, I i know many people do it in, in in four months or less but 
the majority do it in in five or six months or maybe right. seven months sometimes so do you are you glad you went as fast as that or do you wish you'd got a bit, little bit slower to have seen more things or given more time to see more things i often wonder that if people are going so fast if it feels to me like they're rushing or was that just the perfect pace for you i think it was the perfect pace for me i i never really felt like i was rushing at all um and even the days where i would do high 20s or 30 or more miles a day i didn't really feel like i was rushing it just felt like i was seeing so much from the start of the day to the end of the day and because you were going at pretty good pace, you mentioned that you were hiking with somebody at some some stage. How, how long were you hiking with this guy? Was it Stubbs, you said? Yeah, so we hiked on and off together. Uh, I, I first met him somewhere in Virginia. And when I first started hiking with him, there were there were two other guys that also hiked with us. Right. Uh, that was only for uh, maybe three days or so. And then... Um, we were on and off for maybe half a week or so, and then we hiked consistently for about two weeks. And right. then we did, that was, and then that was when we did the four state challenge together. Yes, <laughs> and, and he actually got Lyme disease. Oh, so geez. I then I pulled ahead from him, and we weren't together until he caught up to me in New Hampshire because I got another injury and I was I was off the trail for about a week, so he was able to catch up to me, and then we finished the trail together from there. And did your folks come to Katahdin with you? Yeah, they did. So uh, they met me actually a, uh, a few times through the 100 Mile Wilderness and then at the Golden Road. And then they camped at Katahdin Stream with me also. Right. And did, and did they climb Katahdin with you, though? No, they didn't climb. My brother did. All right. But, but All right. Good. <laughs> of course he did. <laughs> Why wouldn't yeah. he? Uh, right. And I. Something kind of disturbing. Uh, I, she, she, she said I should ask you if anything sketchy happened to you, and something did happen to you. So tell us about the guy that picked you up on uh, when you were hitching a lift, I presume. Yeah, so uh, Bland, Virginia, I had to go in there to pick up a resupply package that I had mm-hmm. sent or my wife sent to me. No luck getting a ride into town, so I walked just about all the way into town, and then someone picked me up. <laughs> Uh, brought me into town and then on the way out I also had trouble getting a ride back to the trail sure. Sure. so I walked uh, about halfway back to the trail and then a car started coming down the road going the opposite way uh-huh. and then drives by maybe 50 feet or so and then he he starts backing up in the road to come back to where I am and he yells out the window and he says hey buddy or hop in or whatever so I'm assuming he's gonna turn around and just give me a, a ride back into to the trail. Right. Uh, but we continued heading towards town and the, he had another hiker with him who I had recognized. Right. I had seen the other day. Uh, and he says, Hey, I'm going to bring you guys back to my place and I'll cook for you and you can stay the night. <sighs> that sounds like a great offer, but I wasn't really looking for that. Uh, uh, that night I was kind of looking forward to getting back to the trail and being in the woods that sure. night. Sure. So what did you um, say to him? What'd you, what'd you say to him? I said, oh, I appreciate the offer, but I, I'd like to get back to the trail. And, and he was kind of persistent. He was like, oh, well, you'll get, you'll get to my place and you'll change your mind. And then so we, <laughs> we get to town and the other hiker does a quick resupply. And then he drives us uh, to his house. And, and the other hiker grabs his bag. And then the guy who, who was driving us looked at me and he says, oh, so, so you're really going to go back to the trail? And I says, yeah, if you don't mind, I'd appreciate it. He's like, all right, I guess. Oh. I don't know. It was, it was just a little strange how pushy he was. Uh, yeah. Which yeah. would have been fine, but. Did he run you back? Yeah, so he, he drove me back to the trail, and then I thanked him for the ride, and, and that was that. But. Mm, I've never heard that sort of thing. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. And he was, being, he was being nice offering the ride. He was just being a little pushy, wanting me to stay at his house. Yeah, just kind of odd, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so you finished, and is there something about the hike that stands out to you? You know, your favourite part of the hike stands out to you above the rest. I would think hiking through your home state must be pretty darn nice. I mean, it's a pretty great state anyway. Um, but were there any other favourite moments on the trail that you you really loved? Yeah, I had a, a, a ton of of favourite spots, you could say. Um, uh-huh. just about all of Georgia was really stands out to me just cause I was 
so excited to finally be out there and the weather was great. Uh, my brother and I were having a good time together. Yeah, sure. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, the Smokies were, were incredible. I was one of the lucky ones to have blue sunny skies the whole way through the Smokies. Wow. Lucky and, you. Yeah. yeah. I've had snow both times I've been through it. Yeah. Broad Highlands, uh, Grayson Highlands, the Virginia Triple Crown, all that stuff was yeah. was really cool to me just because of how different it is from what I'm used to up here. Yeah, so all, all of those spots were really good memories from the hike. Cool. And, and I know that when you and I did speak before, and I tried to take some notes before, you told me you were pretty flat and not overwhelmed at the end when you touched the sign. Have your feelings about that evolved since you've been home? Because I think I think leaving Katahdin behind by in time sometimes changes your, your view. Or did you? I mean, what what have you taken away from this trial? Is really what I'm asking. I guess. Um, I've been trying to figure that out honestly. Um, mm-hmm. It's definitely a, a great experience to have, and I'm glad I went. I feel really accomplished for for doing the whole trail. And, and making good memories along the way. Um, I don't know if I could pinpoint exactly what I've taken away from it, though, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. And I think you're going to continue to find it evolves as time goes on as well. And do, do you think your family sees any changes in you? Well, that they've told you anyway. Or have they noticed something in you that, that's altered since, since the trial? Uh, no, one, no one said anything. Um, <laughs> But I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised if, if, <laughs> if there has been some change. Yeah, I I think I don't think any of us can do it, take a period of, period away from home and go on such an epic journey and accomplish right. something without without having something that changed in our life. Yeah, it's hard to be the same person when you get back home after walking in the woods for oh I think four so. Six months. Yeah. I totally agree. And, and now that you're back in real life, what are you doing now? Are you working now? Uh, not working right now. I've had a little difficulty in trying to find a job since I've been home but uh, my wife's obviously still supportive so she's helping me search around and be an engineer yeah I mean you know the world's your oyster in it you can you can go anywhere couldn't you really so I don't worry about that too much and what's next for you as far as hiking goes in so for now just enjoying the whites right since they're right here in my backyard and Mm. getting up to Baxter State Park when I can Uh, long term though is the I have the CDT on my on my radar for my next hike in I want to say in the next year or two would be ideal for me. And I know that you've got you've apparently earned an ambassadorship with High Plight Mountain Gear. So how'd that happen? Yeah, so I, I applied to be part of that program before I set out on my hike. Right. And and I got accepted into that. What does that entail then? What what do they do? And what do you do? So I, I can just share posts or whatever on social media and include their products and right. for doing that I can I can get some benefits from them and get some free gear. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> you can't be free gear. Can't be free gear, can you? Right. Well look, you know, I'm kind of I'm kind of sad that you didn't hike with your mother because you know she's uh she would have been a, a, she is an interesting character in in her own right and I would think sharing the trail with your mother would have been quite fun because, because she she's got opinions isn't she <laughs> she would yeah. have expressed them to she would have expressed them to you from time to time I suspect yeah well maybe, maybe I'll, I'll hike with, with her when she does it a third time because I'm sure she will <laughs> there you go now that, that would be fun that would be fun okay mate well look I appreciate you coming on and sharing your story with me I'm sorry about the technical hiccups we had earlier um but uh, let me know if you go on CDT let's let us know and we'll have you on and talk about that as well yeah, thanks for having me. I had a, had a good time talking with you. All right. Take it easy, okay? All right. Bye. Cheers, then. Bye. I'm sorry about the sound again. As I said, there was plenty of editing to do, but I hope you're able to hear Patch. He's a very laid-back guy and clearly a confident hiker. I'm sure he's got more than enough to take on the CDT. And of course, <laughs> once you've got two, you might as well go for the Triple Crown. So I'm sure we're going to hear from him again someday. Before we hear from Betty, I just wanted to mention that I've started putting some performance shirts on the hrntradingpost.com website. Several of you reached out to me saying that we only had cotton shirts and that you'd like to get some of those moisture wicking shirts. 
So I've added three, I think it is. But I'll be adding more during today, if you're listening the day this comes out. So check them out. I'm hoping to wear some of them at trial day, so come and say hi to me in the author's tent. Now, here's Betty. Good morning. Hey, Betty, how are you? I'm well, how are you? You're taking a day off today, aren't you? <laughs> yes, we are. You, slack, we you slacker. Tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, and well, that's what we're going to do tomorrow. Oh, really? Go for it. Yeah. Why, yep. is, that, why is that? You feel the feel need of a bit of rest now? Well, just we can add some miles. You know, we can do 20 miles with nothing on our back versus, you know, something on our back. Plus, since we're doing a resupply, it'll give us, you know, a chunk of miles without a lot of weight on our back. Right. That's true. That's true. So how is, um, who is us? Um, it's still the same five people that we, you know, keep bumping into. Right. We all nice. started the same day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. We don't necessarily hike together right. in the daytime. Yeah, but is, does that work for your psyche? Because I know you're. you're I, I, I'm, I was just looking at something you, you said uh, a couple of weeks ago about the shelters being too full of personalities. Um, is that yeah. something that fits well with your psyche? Y- y- yeah, um, and, you know, I can see that there could come a time that we end up, you know, parting ways or whatever. Sure. And if somebody wanted to. Um, go on ahead you know that would be perfectly fine too yeah, yeah. um or not do a zero these these families can be incredibly dynamic and that's a good thing i think you know being open to other people being around and joining the group and leaving the group i think it's a wonderful yeah. part of the trial and when we last spoke you were at albert mountain at the at the fire tower where are you now we're in hot springs like 260 something Wow. How does it feel to have walked 260 miles when you look at that number? It's quite something, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, I've been keeping track of marathon, you know, uh, rates. Um, I do the Jimmy Fun Boston Marathon Walk for Dana Farber every year, Uh and that's 26 miles. And I, I thought to myself, if you take the 2194 or whatever it is this year and divide it by... 26.2 26.2 how many marathons is it yeah. and it's 84 um so every time you know we knock off or i knock off another one it's cool 10 marathons um, 10 marathons now then yeah that's yeah. A, that's awesome isn't it that is really awesome. and what do you feel like once you've done a marathon you, you, you say you've done this dana farber marathon every uh, every year so what does that feel like when, when, when you when you were doing that before you started your hike well, that was the very first time I did it, and you cross that finish line. You know, it's a walk. It's not a run. Sure, sure. Um, but the first time, you know, you've trained for it for months, and the first time you cross that finish line and you've actually done 26 miles, yeah. you're hooked. Um, and that's kind of how it feels out here. That's nice. That's really cool. nice. That's real nice. So we said you were at Albert Mountain last time, and you're now in Hot Springs. And I know you've had yep. a few of the really great highlights. Uh, I know you had a you had a problem um, coming down into the NOC, and we we haven't actually talked about it on the show, but you and I have talked about yep. it. Let's talk about that now. What happened? Well, I was going down the trail. It was just a normal trail, uh, and then all of a sudden, it got to a corner that in the AWOL guide, they call jump off. And in the far out, they call it a view. Um, But you got Mm -hmm. to about a three foot ledge um, that just stuck out into nowhere. And I couldn't get within five feet of it. Um, And you were supposed to go out on this ledge, turn 270 degrees, and then go down. And I thought, if I got past this one, what's to say there aren't 10 more between here and the bottom? And I just couldn't do it. So, so I had no. Were you with Were you with people at the time? I, yeah, I was with uh, Sierra, now known as Pop Tart, um, and she. <laughs> Sierra is much nicer than Pop Tart, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, she instantly took off her pack and was going to take my pack, and um, you know, just anything to help me get down. And I said, I just can't do it. Um, so wow. I turned around and hiked five point eight miles back to Teleco Gap. Oh, and um that must be miserable. 
well, I was telling everybody as they said, are you going southbound? And I said, well, I am now. Um, <laughs> um, but I was able to get a shuttle down and um, talk to folks, you the next morning and got the kind of go ahead that, you know, give it a try. Just keep going. Um, mm. And I did. And that was 130 miles ago. So, you know, life goes on. Yeah. So how do you feel about that now? Because that's, that's going to rankle you a little bit, I suspect, at some stage. Oh, I mean, it gets better every day. Um, Good, but, yeah. you know, the first few days was just horrible. Um, and I, it mm. still bugs the hell out of me. But, you know, it is what it is. I couldn't do it. Um, mm. And knock on wood, I don't find too many more spots like that because I really enjoy doing what I'm doing. And, you know, I want to get it done. Well, that was a bit of a low light for you then, I guess. Oh, but for you, sure. you've had, you've had a few highlights as well because I know that you've been, you actually got to the NOC from the other route, I presume. Yeah. Um, so how how much of the trail did you actually miss? Is it about a mile and a bit? Um. No, I think I think from there down was probably like one tenth different than what I had to do going backwards. I think. Oh, right. Um, oh, okay. Hey, I'm not sure. I haven't looked at it so much from the other way. But, sure. you know, uh, I either shrug my shoulders and be content with, you know, what I do or, um, as was mentioned previously, you know, fly back down and um, go at it from the other side and see what happens. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? That's good. It allows you to get on with the rest of the hike. Yeah. And then, and then you may want to consider that when you finish. But if you don't, that's also fine. Let's face it. Yeah. You've done, you've done, you've done as you as we said just now. You've done ten bloody marathons. So I mean, yeah. really, it's it's amazing what you know what you've already done there. So after that, of course, after the NOC, you got that horrendous climb out, <laughs> which just went on and on forever. And then you get down, go down to Fontana get Dam, and then of course the Smokies. How was yep. the Smokies for? How are the Smokies for you? Uh, we had good weather, you know, so nice. that was a plus. We were short sleeves most days, uh, rain one or two. Um, and, you know, the the shelter, we're A, in the bubble, and B, the shelters, um, you know, don't hold very many people. So you were able to tent near the shelters. Um, right. But, right. you know, it's so different. Um, every day in the Smokies was different. Um, yes. geographically and surroundings, you know, one day you're going through gladed woods with flowers and then the next day you're in pine and moss and, um, you know, all of the elevations are five to 6,000 feet. Um, yes. so it's totally different. And then when you're coming down, all of a sudden you're at, you know, 3000 again and your, your spring is back. So it, it was very cool. I enjoyed the Smokies a lot. And then after the Smokies, of course, you've got Max Patch, which was one of my yep. favourite spots on the trail yep. in 2014. And I couldn't yep. see anything in 2019. Did you get the 360 degree view? Yes, we did. Um, and they um, they have it blocked off. You can only really stay on the trail. They're trying to work on the revegetation, sure, um, so sure. there's no camping there. But yeah, the views were terrific. Um, that was fun. And, and are people sticking with that? I mean, a uh, 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 um Trial runners uh, checking that out? I haven't you know, seen uh, anybody since Georgia. Oh, right. Um, okay. No, haven't seen any, you know, AT people, um, except for um, we did see um, some trail crews uh, back up in the Smokies when you're winding from Tennessee to North Carolina um, right. on horses. Um, the trail crew with saddlebags with chainsaws in them, you know, to take wow. care of the drop trees and yeah, amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. So you're in you're in Hot Springs now, and yep. um, where are you where are you staying in Hot Springs? Um, Laughing Heart. All right, Hospital. is that nice? You enjoying that? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, there are others that I've enjoyed more, but um, it's fine. Yeah, it was it was a bed, and there's a shower, and there's a, a <laughs> town nearby. It's a win win, does it? Start? Doesn't have you? You've probably got to that state of grace, so that a lot of a lot of people seem to achieve that. You, it makes you appreciate those things, you know, a, a, run, a flushing toilet and a shower and so on. Oh, for have sure. You, have, have you got to that situation? It, because oh. it does change your perspective on a lot of things. Oh, yeah. No, life is life is very simple. You know, when you've got one of everything, um, yeah. you, you just enjoy um, having that one of everything clean. Yeah. 
And has Bruce Depp been down to see you yet? Uh, is he no, down? I, yeah, he is coming down, but I don't think until Parisburg. Okay. Okay. Well, look, I'm glad we sorted out our um, technical difficulties, and I will explain to people what that means in a minute yeah. <laughs> once we get out. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I suspect it was my fault. Um, but uh, just keep going, enjoy it, and don't. And I, I'm glad you've done, had that mindset that you've, yeah. you've, you've put that in the past, and once yep. you get to Qatar, you then have to think about yep. what you're going to do next, all right? Oh, one other thing I was going to ask you. Yeah. Have you noticed many people – Stopping, or you, in, in other words, is is the trail thinning out a little bit now? I haven't seen that. I saw one fellow with um, wicked shin splints, and I think he might have had to get off. Um, but um, I can't say that I've really seen that. Okay, and are the shelters? It, it, so the area around the shelters is it? Are they all still very pretty busy most nights? Yeah, um, you know the shelters will fill, and uh, you know most people prefer their tents anyway. Of course. Yeah, of course, yeah. um, and even yeah. at the hostels, you know, the hostels still, and people are tenting in the yards at the hostels. Right. And have you worked out your <laughs> your sleeping arrangements because you 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 were waking up about two o'clock in the morning? Is that still happening to you, or are you starting to work it out a bit better? Um, if I'm in a hostel, I'll sleep better. Um, but in my tent, you know, I, it, damn it, it's two, it's two o'clock and I wake up and then I at least can toss and turn and, you know, go back to sleep. Um, and mm. I have a package coming today and I think it's not going to have my one pound chair. So that will <sighs> make, that will make life good, you know, so that I'm, you know, if I wake up and I am tossing and turning, I can sit and I can read or write or something. That's so, a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It, nice. I think my back, um, you know, it just isn't used to being uh, flat as a pancake for that long. Mm, so, yeah. And what about the physicality? Is that working out for you? Do you feel yeah, you've got your, your legs? So you've got your legs now, have you? Well, I never had any muscle issues. Um, oh, cool. What has dramatically changed is that climbing. You know, when you used to have to stop multiple <laughs> times for that three yes. or four breaths. Yeah. Now you just, you know, I have a baseball hat on and you can only see, you know, six feet in front of you and you just keep going. And so every good. once in a while you look up and say, oh, we're almost at the top. Um, <laughs> so that's all been good. That's great. That's great. Well, you, you, you seem to, I'm reading your blog and you seem to be enjoying it, Betty. So yeah. uh, oh, definitely. just keep on trucking, as I say. Okay. All right. Thank you, Steve. Bye then. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. I really felt for Betty when she called me one morning about that moment when she had to turn around. It cannot have been easy for her. But she rallied and now she's 10 marathons into a hike. I love the way she counts doing a marathon as a, another part of the hike. Really nice. I feel pretty sure that once she gets to the end, she want to get that section out of the way. Maybe by walking south out of the NOC and completing her through hike that way. If she wants me to, I'll drive up there and go with her. Now... Someone we last heard from when he was just about to head out. Here's Brian Robbins. Hello. Hey, Brian. Steve, how are you? Hey, Steve. Matty Blue, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, so when we last spoke, um, I think you were I, you were just about to get started, weren't you? That's correct. Yeah, so, the, and you're the, still there. <laughs> you're still right. there. Yeah, yeah, the episode aired while I was driving to Emma Cola. Uh, right. to start the approach trail. So tell us, about, tell us firstly, tell us about the approach trail, and then tell us where you are. Well, the approach trail, I slack packed. My wife was at the lodge, and uh, that went, all went well. And mm -hmm. that, if you remember that weekend, I was going up, and then I still had to go back and work two or three days to retire. That's right. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so that went well, and it, as it turns out. I was all the way to Neil's Gap before and had not spent the night in the tent because when we went back, uh, I just couldn't see my wife being in a lodge and me being out in the tent. So I was all the way to mile 30 before I uh, that she said goodbye to me there finally and <laughs> my first night in the tent. 
I got a little, I got a little bit of a hard time with some of the fellow hikers about that. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> people do ease themselves into it sometimes, and you know, you, you'd certainly have to do that. So you went back to work after was it three or four days? Yeah, it was. Uh, I had three. I took. I was off the trail three days, yep. and the uh, day I checked out of the. The VA hospital, um, we drove that night all the way back to Georgia, and oh. I got on the trail the following day. And uh, And I didn't slack pack except for the approach trail. I I, I hiked, even though I was going to spend the night in a lodge, I hiked with a yeah. full a full pack. So There's no need to do that. You need People need to get over themselves. <laughs> <laughs> if you, listen, th- what you should be carrying on your back is what you need for that day. You did not need your tent for that day. <laughs> <laughs> For a long time, so you should definitely not die. So where, where are you now then? Where are you now? I, uh, my wife picked me up yesterday in Fontana at Fontana Dam, right at the dam, the visitor center. Sure. And we are in a bed and breakfast in Bryson City. Right. Nice. Mm-hmm. So you've, you've been on since you got back on that. So how long have you now been, how many days have you been on there now? Well, uh, I'm subtracting the three days I went back yeah. to retire, yeah. and so this is what is this? The 29th. This is day 19. April 10th right. is my adjusted day. So day 19, and I'm at Fontana, and in the morning I'll be starting into the Smokies. Oh, exciting! That's exciting time. So you know you've done these these early miles. You've done Nantahala Outdoor Center, which is always a pretty great place right. to go to, and the and the walk down there as well. How are you finding it so far? Um. It has been great. The last two days before getting, the last three days in the, before getting into Fontana, it rained the entire day, all three days. And <laughs> I had, at a mile 150, I had only two falls and I had wow. three fall, three falls in 24 hours coming out <laughs> down into Fontana Dam. Oh, I, pulled a, I pulled a calf muscle. Oh, oh, it was those last couple of days were really tough, really cold, really wet. We checked in. I mean, we uh, stopped oh about eight miles from Fontana at this the worst shelter we've had. That uh, it's it's only the second time I've stayed in a shelter, but right. we thought it's raining. We're going to get some relief from this rain in the shelter, and it leaked on us all night. And we had rain <laughs> flies stretched out. It oh, was. Dear. It was a mess, but you know what they say, right? No pain, no rain, no main. That's right. Yeah, you've had you certainly had some some rain then. So so your your calf muscle is. Did you just walk that off, or how how's that feeling now? It, it well, it's feeling now that I'm walking around Bryson City. It feels fine, but uh, mm. when I do that four thousand foot ascent tomorrow morning, we'll see. Um, yeah, well, I've been yeah. doing my own physical therapy on it. And uh, I got some special cream. I've been working on it, and uh, we'll we'll see how it goes. It's just gotta. I've had this before, the same yeah. calf muscle with playing tennis, and never missed a match. And so, uh, so you're right. Your age right. playing tennis, bloody hell. <laughs> 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 what, you're, that's, that, that is asking for trouble, I tell you. So, 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 what are your impressions of the trail so far? You know, how how is it? Um, is it what you imagine it would be? Is it worse, tougher, easier? I mean, what are your general overall impressions? You know, living in Mississippi and not being able to do the the right a number of shakedown hikes as I was working towards retirement. Sure. The ascent, it's really taken me time to get my trail legs to the yeah. to the uphills. Uh, I have no problem when it's flat or when it's or when it's not raining and downhill. Yeah, and yeah. but uh, but uh, the, it's I'm slowly getting my trail legs on the on the inclines. It's probably taking me a little bit longer than I thought. I thought I'd be up to 15 mile days easily. Uh, my biggest day so far is a 14 mile day, and uh, uh, but it's going to come. Yeah, you know, there's there's no hurry though. You you've got no precondition. You have to be back at a certain time, do you? So you got no. you got certainly got plenty of time to do it. Are you um are you enjoying it? I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying. Uh, I hiked with the day I left out of Neil's Gap. I I got a trail buddy, and we've done hostels together, and a right. you know, and a um, uh, 
Roach Motel together. And, and, uh, so yesterday I said goodbye to him because I came to do this. You know, I took a zero day today and he's already up in the smoke. He's uh, hiking up in there, but, uh, that was, that was 14 days of hiking with him. That was, that was pretty good. So I, I've, and I've enjoyed meeting all these other people. There's uh, 95% of the people I've met are genuine and, uh, really a really good social community yeah and, and now you're you're let's say you started um in april so april the, i think april the 11th 10. something like that 10 yeah. yeah so you started in april which is which is later for a lot of people are you is it still quite busy out there uh i, I yeah it's real there's there's been some shelter sites where not counting in the shelter but there's been like 20 tents Wow. Wow. So, so yeah, that's, it's, it's still like going, I've seen some people drop and some people that <laughs> probably should drop, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, it's, yeah, it's still, I've seen, I've had a lot of people pass me that, you know, you don't know. worry about that. Don't ever worry yeah. about that. I, I, I didn't pass a single person. I don't think what I was liking, you know, <laughs> and, the, and this doesn't matter because you, the, it's a chance for an introduction to somebody in there. You can have a chat as, it, as they go past, as, as they grind up the dust in front of you. Although you're not right. probably not seeing too much dust at the moment. Have you had some sunny days as well? Oh yeah. Plenty, plenty sunny days. Um, I think, uh, going up Trey mountain was pretty hot. And, wow. Uh, wow. I kind of like the days that are in between, like cloudy. <laughs> yeah, cloudy, sure, cool. I, I agree. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> it's it's nice. It's nice to wake up though without rain going on. You know, I I, I used to hate getting ready in, in 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 the morning in the rain. So, how many miles have you done so far? How many miles is it to Fontana Dam? That's uh, one sixty. Seven, I think it is one sixty-seven. Yeah, well, that ain't nothing, is it? You know, let's face it. You no, know, that's that's quite a few miles. And uh, right. imagine walking yeah. walking from your front front door, one hundred and sixty odd miles. So you, you you're you're getting into it. You're getting into it now. I, I know you have still got plenty to go. What's the? Uh, I'm trying to think where you are. You've got smokers. You're going to stop in Gatlinburg, or you're going to try to go all the way through? Well, I've been going through my pack today, and my wife had all kinds of supplies with her, and. Uh, the only thing I haven't done is food yet. I'm going to see how these days food for one has been a surprise to me. You know, I buy out those prepackaged meals sure. and I don't think I'm doing any more of those because you pour that hot water in there and then you can eat a quarter of it. Now you got to carry out that. Uh, I'm, I'm all into the ramen right now. I'd, oh, never really? eaten, I'd never eaten ramen noodles before in my life before this, and uh, that's what all I want to do when I'm done hiking right now is eat the ramen, put Good I put Lord. peanut butter in it, and uh, uh, that's that's my evening thing. But I'm going to uh, look at all that. What about your gear, Brian? Is that working out for you? Um, I like my tent. It's probably a little heavier than it should be because it's that uh, hubba hubba, and uh, right. my pack is doing great, and uh, my mat. My sleeping bag is great. I'm not ready to. I've, I've been a little hot, if anything, in it. But I'm going to get through the Smokies before I switch it out. My wife brought my 30 degree, but I don't. I got to watch those Smokies, so I'm going to. Yeah, I'm they wait. can they can bite you in the ass for that. <laughs> you know it. I tell you. Yeah, yeah. So my 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 buddy, I had to give him my liner a couple of times because he was just so cold. He had wow. a 30 degree quilt. And mm. he was just freezing, sleeping in his puffy and his rain jacket. Wow. And uh, so I gave him my liner a few nights. Mm. But I'm going to get through the smokes for a change. The only thing that's not working is my sleeping pad. And I just went here in Bryson City and the outfitter didn't have anything better. My pad, uh, it's kind of bottoming out at my hip, mm. uh, on my mm. hip joints when I sleep by my side. And been making it a little sore, but... Yeah, I'll make it work. Uh, I have the, a little rubber pad to stick under it. Have you been given a trial name yet? I did. I am. Uh, I am PT Cruiser. PT so Cruiser. Physical, physical therapy. You know, PT <laughs> PT Cruiser. PT and Cruiser is good. Nice. I kind of did it like this. I I had some names I thought in mind, and I didn't really name myself. I didn't want to name myself. So when I was hiking. 
I said, okay, all the way to North Carolina, I will pull other through hikers. And if they, whatever they choose, by the time I get to North Carolina, well, I was only halfway through Georgia and it was like nine to one to one <laughs> that they all wanted PT Cruiser. So that's, that's what I went with. <laughs> Okay, man. well, look, look. I'm glad you're enjoying it. I'm glad you're still going. Some of some of our class have already dropped out, so it's uh, it's good for you that you're still still moving forward. Um, stay in touch. Send me a text when there's a few things to to talk, report back in again, and we'll get in touch then. Okay. Thanks a bunch, Mighty Blue. Okay, buddy. You take it easy. All right. Bye all then. Right, see Bye. 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 So he retired while he was doing a through hike. Nice one. I've often thought that people who get interrupted on their hike, in this case to go home and retire, can't really get into the hike until that's done. Now with that out of the way, Brian is moving into it nicely with the Smokies next on his agenda. Now I want to thank our donors, as always. Thanks to our monthly donors, Justin Mullins, Kevin Eastman, Ann Dobson, Mike DiCello and Jens Lebheider. If you enjoy our show, indeed any of our eight available shows on the Hiking Radio Network, then why not drop us a couple of bucks, preferably monthly, to support our efforts? You can do that very easily on the hikingradionetwork.com website, and I will be forever grateful. Now, our final member today of the Class of 23. Mary Marks and her intrepid companion, Wiley, have hit the Virginia Triple Crown. I was really hoping to be able to speak with Mary at McAfee Knob, but we weren't able to record until she passed that iconic spot. Still, she was on the way to the awesome Tinker Cliffs. So let's hear how Mary and Wiley are getting on. Here she is. Hello. Hey, Mary. That's better. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> how are you then? So you've just done McAvee Knob? I did. Oh, my gosh. It was awesome. Talk us through it. Tell us about Tell everybody about it. I, I, I wanted to actually interview you when you were on the top of McAvee Knob, but it didn't work out. So tell us what that was like. Well, it's part of the Virginia Triple Crown. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first one is Dragon's Tooth. Then you go to to Maxby Knob, which is this outcrop, stone outcrop that you can walk out on, and it just drops into oblivion. <laughs> did you sit on the? Do you sit on the end? <laughs> I did not. <laughs> I did not. Oh, <laughs> but I had my picture taken. I got out as far as um, I felt comfortable with. Um, but yeah. yeah, amazing view. Just, it is. And you, do you see it on a nice day as well? Is it a nice day today? Well, a couple hours ago, it was nice. It's starting to cloud up now because we're going to get rain for the next few days. Right, but right. yeah, I did have a beautiful, clear view of of the area. Yeah, and we nice. really haven't spoken for a little while. Firstly, is, is Wiley still with you? He is. Oh, good old Wiley. Good look, good look. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I'm really pleased. And in fact, you said since we spoke, I'm looking at the text you sent me. It was before 400 miles. So you're now over 700 miles. Um, talk us through the various highlights there. You've got, the, you've got waterfalls and Watauga Lake. So talk about that. Oh, the waterfall, the Laurel Falls. It's one of the prettiest, I'm told, on the trail. It's glorious. So it was a, yeah. a really nice place to stop and have lunch. And just Did you go swimming? Take some time. I did not. It was still very cold. <laughs> I went and it was bloody freezing, I tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not that brave. <laughs> and then, um, well, to the lake. Oh, my gosh. When you, I, I stayed at that Boots Off hostel. Great, great place. And then when, when you leave there, you're just following that lake for like 16 miles. I mean, oh. that's how long the lake is. Yeah. I don't know how long the, the trail was, maybe. Um, you know, up and over that ridge, just beautiful scenery. And that's a lovely, that easy, lake. lovely, easy ridge, isn't it? Into into Damascus. I mean, even I did ten miles yeah. in about three and a bit, three and a bit hours. And you have, as you say, you've got the lake. When you get on the ridge, you can see the lake on your right all the time, can't you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely a very awesome. Long way. Yes, and well, and of course there there was no foliage, so I could see everything. Of course, yeah, of course. And you've put at the end at the end here, and I'm going to talk about the other places in a minute. You said you're just a little bit tired of the cold. Is it not starting to warm up yet, or not? <laughs> it is, but we did have a few um, very chilly nights uh, a few days ago. Mm. Um, not as bad as it was in February and early March, but yeah, 
just made you think, like, oh, I just want to be done with this. Yeah, yeah, I bet, yeah. And you're, not, you're obviously not going to be at trial days because that's coming up in a couple of weeks and you're already through Damascus. Where did you stay in Damascus? I am. Did you stay in Damascus anywhere? I did not. I did not. But the thing about Damascus, and I and I want to go back there. I might even show up for trail days. Yeah, nice. But y- you walk right through the town. If yeah. anyone who doesn't know, you know, you go right through this lovely town. It's just adorable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What a what a place to have a trail go through. It certainly is. And of you course, know? after that, you got the the ponies at Grace and Highlands. How did oh, how did why how did Wiley inter, interact with the ponies? You know, he really he was fine. He wasn't. Um, he was a bit standoffish to them. All right. And they were curious. Right. But they were just so adorable. You know, I I had them for two days. I'd spent the night at that one shelter. Yeah. Um, yeah. There and then I saw them again the next morning. So the, yeah, I got my fill of the ponies. Nice, oh, real fun. nice. And then you've also got your fill of alpacas because you, you stayed the and place the, I stayed. The long, long uh, neck. Uh, uh, non, and that's a great. Is it long neck lair hostel? That's a really good yeah, place to stay as well, isn't it? It is. It is very friendly folks and a nice hostel. And, and the alpacas were so cute. <laughs> You know, you sound like I mean, I, I, reading your text. I knew you were having a great time, but you then you then talked about Burt's Garden. Now, I didn't stay in a hostel at Burt's Garden, but there you go up Chestnut Knob Shelter and stay there, and you got that amazing view across Burt's Garden, haven't you? Yes, that view. You know, just walking that ridge where you can look down into Burt's Garden. It mm. was just amazing. And you know what really makes me wonder, you know, people who say Virginia, they get the Virginia blues. Yeah. I don't know how that's possible because there's so many things to look forward to. I totally agree. And funny enough, you reliving your, even this text with you, to, it just reminds me of so many great times. I think the Virginia blues is because it takes you so darn long to get out of Virginia. And you don't yeah. feel like you're making progress. But, you know, once you leave it, you start looking back and thinking, these are amazing places to be. In fact, I would say Virginia is, is certainly a favourite state, if certainly not the favourite, but certainly a favourite state to, to go to because there are so many great things to see. And, yeah. of course, you went to Woods Hole, <laughs> of course. Oh, my gosh. I was there for three days. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> three, I did. I mean, you know, why wouldn't I? <laughs> yeah, quite right, too. Yeah, quite right, too. If anyone who doesn't know Woods Hole, it's like the amazing hostel on the trail and, and Neville and her cooking and her crew. And I just felt you know, refresh and I was happy to be there and met so many wonderful people. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. good. It's special. It's a special place, and you already referred to it. But um, you're going to hit. You're going to hit Tinker Cliffs soon. But you done. You did Dragon's Tooth, and from my memory of Dragon's Tooth, going down from Dragon's Tooth is a bloody nightmare. Oh, oh my gosh, wasn't it? <laughs> how did How did the two of you cope with that? Because you know, Wiley has to do that as well, and I would think that's quite tough. Well, he's like a mountain goat. You know, he has those four paws, so he maneuvered it quite well. There's only that one spot where they have the bars to hold on to, the oh, yeah. two metal bars. Yeah, yeah. I did help him down that part. But other than that, he's like jumping over those rocks, like what's taking me so long. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a lovely to climb down. And did you, once you were at Dragon's Tooth, did you climb up it? Part of the way, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm not too big on those height things. <laughs> I wasn't that brave again, but I did take some nice photos. Now I know that poor old Joe Mitchell has passed from Four Pines. It, when you get down from Dragon's Tooth, what I mean, where did you stay that night? Uh, from Dragon's Tooth, I actually went into uh, Salem. Oh right, okay. I got Fine. yeah. I got off to, and in Catawba yeah. and then went to – just took a drive into Salem and stayed there. I just needed a good resupply. So, you're, as I say, you're going to hit Tinker Cliffs, which is actually one of my – another of my real favourites and kind of an unsung favourite because McAfee McAf- Knob gets such attention, and deservedly so, but Tinker Cliffs is epic – you're going to love it when you get there. I just I thought oh, it was good. Yeah. A, a truly special place. So reflect now on 700 miles. You're a third of the way there. How do you feel? I feel so good that um, I am looking forward to this next part of the journey. It's 
it's going so well, so smooth. Mm. Um, I, I'm feeling good. My legs feel good. Yeah. Every, you know, it's just, and the people I'm meeting and re-meeting. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a special part. I mean, I know we always talk about that, the people and that, but are, are you actually hiking with anybody or, or you're just seeing people from time to time and just reconnecting with them? Yep. Just seeing them time to time. I'm finding that, and, and I probably knew this at the beginning that I would hike by myself only because my hiking style, I'm slow. I stop when I want to stop, you know, um, try to try to keep up with someone. I, I will not do that. Well, you know what though, you know, this is, you're still in April and you're a third of the way through. So I wouldn't worry about your hiking style. Your hiking style is certainly getting you there. And actually I've just seen another of your highlights of just uh, looking back on the text you sent me in the last couple of days, you, you went to your Roan High Knob Mountain as well, Roan High Knob Shelter rather. But then after that, you go down to Carver's Gap, then you go across Jane Ball and the various balls and, and, yes, and Hunt Mountain. Yes. Isn't that fantastic part of the trail? Oh my gosh, just beautiful. You know, it, it's one thing to walk through these forests, but then when you come out to a bald or yeah. to a meadow, it's like, wow. <laughs> yeah, the balls the balls are particularly special for me. They're actually they are the highlight of the south for me. Those those balls and and going over it, I've I've heard different people. I, I've, I've twice gone over Jane Board, obviously, and and I had fantastic weather both times. How was your weather when you went across the balls? Because it's a very exposed area, isn't it? Oh, it was snow covered. Oh, really? It was beautiful. It wow. was beautiful. Wow. The snow was just like frosted onto every single twig and leaf and grass it was beautiful <laughs> I, I, you haven't said this yet but have you have you fallen yet mary <laughs> <laughs> and i think of you every time <laughs> <laughs> no i actually i i i fell probably with during the smokies it was real muddy and yeah. those are more like mud slides yeah. where you end up on your bottom yeah. um, but i did have a good fall about a week ago out of nowhere i don't know how it happened i just ended up you know face planet right <laughs> have you have you injured yourself uh, at all no no i just laid there for a minute and assessed the situation and wiley's hovering over me like what are you doing down there <laughs> <You know? laughs> did you shout out the and, number yeah, I, do you shout out the number like I, I do? <laughs> I did not, but I thought of you. <laughs> That's a habit you need to get into, Mary, I tell you. <laughs> Oh, I hope dear. not. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, the habit you don't want to get into there. But if, if you reach less than ten, you'd be okay. Well, look, All right. well, look, stay in touch. I'm so delighted. You know that you're you're not only carrying on, but you're just reveling in it. You, know, you sound like you're reveling I in it, am. and I really appreciate those texts. So I know where you are, and I know what's happening, and I can. It takes it takes me back there as well. I'm sure people listening to you today will remember those places and think to themselves, yes. "Yeah, Virginia is not too bad." Yeah. Yeah, it's it's awesome. It's awesome. Nothing to fear. Yes, quite right. <laughs> Damn right. Nothing to fear. Well, look, stay in touch. Um, so pleased you're doing well, and uh, say hi to Wiley for me. I will. Thanks, Steve. Good okay. talking to you. And you. Bye then. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> She's another trooper, and clearly having the time of her life out there. She's a quiet, kind of reserved woman, but she keeps on keeping on. Nice one, Mary. Finally today, Joseph Alice is two-thirds of the way through his 80 through hike. It's funny, you know, when you're out there, fractions that you rarely mention in real life come very much into focus when you calculate how far you've gone and how far there is to go. I'll see you next week. Chapter 17. Decadence. Kent, Connecticut to Sages Ravine, Massachusetts. Friday the 12th of August 1983, mile 1429. Intense thunder showers intermixed with steady pounding rain throughout the night. Definitely a good night to be in a motel room. A cold drizzle was still falling in the morning with occasional bursts of heavy rain. I fortified myself with two excellent breakfasts at the diner across the street from my motel and spent an hour loading my pack for the next couple of days on the trail. I didn't need to carry a lot of food. I have some more family and friends meeting me near the Massachusetts border Sunday night. We waited until noon when we thought the bulk of the rain was past to drive back to Kent. We drove in an intermittent drizzle, making a stop at a grocery so that Pick could pick up some groceries for the trail. 
A couple of short downpours along the way were a strong indication that the day would be a washout. The air remained very cool, but the rain had tapered to a fine mist when Pete and I reached the Appalachian Trail. The first couple of miles were on rural paved roads. We covered that roadwalk quickly and entered the woods for the passage through Macedonia Brook State Park. The trail through Macedonia was the first of three short stretches of the Appalachian Trail I'd hiked prior to this trip, so I was finally on familiar ground. We took our first break of the day at Chase Mountain Shelter, about a mile into the park. I remembered the place to be an absolute armpit and was interested to discover if my opinion would be different after months of living in these lean-tos, many of which were quite old and weathered. It wasn't. The dirt-floored structure was less than a half mile from the park road on a heavily travelled section of trail. It was thoroughly vandalised and trashed out. Conversely, the open, grassy crest of Cobble Mountain, one and a half miles later, looked just as lovely today as the image which had lingered in my memory. Encircling the summit was a sprawly, rocky meadow with extensive views to the north and west. The mountain overlooked a lush, green valley filled with forests and pastures in the foothills of eastern New York State. On a clear day, one looks out over a broad panorama extending from the Catskills in the west to the Taconic Mountains and the Berkshires in the north. Those distant reaches were concealed by veils of fog and mist today, but nebulous glimpses of the vast rural valley below the shifting veils made the climb still worthwhile. Macedonia Brook abounded in tough climbs. The rocky trail off Cobble Mountain descended very steeply over boulders sheathed with slick, dripping moss. There were more nice views a mile later from the top of Pine Hill. The entire state park was beautiful, one of the nicest stretches on the Appalachian Trail since Shenandoah National Park in Virginia. The sad thing about this is that the Appalachian Trail will soon be relocated, bypassing the state park completely in order to eliminate the roadwalks on either side. Many through hikers would never notice the difference anyway. From what I've been reading in the registers, it seems that many are walking Macedonia Brook Road through the park. It's shorter than the AT and eliminates the tough climbs, but it also misses a few excellent mountain views. Personally, one of the reasons I came on the Appalachian Trail was to see the Appalachian Mountains. After Pine Hill, the Appalachian Trail descended to Macedonia Brook Road, the park's dirt access road, and followed it past Four Corners Campground, still in the state park. There was a pump for drinking water in the campground. Pete and I had dinner there. Darkness was due to fall long before we could reach the next available water on the trail for camp tonight. With dinner out of the way and full water bottles in our packs, we were free to camp wherever we could pitch our tents. A couple of miles of road walking followed the campground before the trail climbed up to a summit called Caleb's Peak, covered by a pleasant open forest with partial views over the Housatonic River Valley below. We pitched our tents on a little patch of grass beneath the trees and made our camp for tonight, having come nine miles on this short day. The weather had remained agreeably cool all day, and the rain had abated just enough so that we could enjoy some nice views. We passed the two-thirds point of the entire Appalachian Trail, It was a satisfactory day in many respects. It's good to be back in New England and I'll be shooting for a day in the 20 mile range tomorrow. Saturday the 13th of August 1983, mile 1449.5. It was still cloudy this morning when I woke up and the air had turned even chillier. I had not seen a morning that cold since Tennessee. After the persistent heat wave that dogged me through Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, New Jersey and New York, shivering was a pleasure. Still, in order to warm up, I really had to start moving quickly when I hit the trail. Thankfully, I had some decent trail and some enchanting scenery to get my engine going. The first nice view of the day was a mile up the trail from St John's Ledges. A hundred yard stretch of open ledges perched atop high, steep granite cliffs overlooking the Housatonic River Valley. I reached it just as the early clouds were drifting off over the eastern horizon and the day was turning fine. The river below meandered gracefully through a charming landscape of quiet beauty. Forests and fields along the banks and wooded ridges flanking the valley appeared idyllic and almost surreal in the slanting, rose-tinted early morning sunlight. The Appalachian Trail clawed down the face of the cliffs on a new trail which is supposed to be a vast improvement over the old trail. All I can say is that the old one must have absolutely sucked because the new one is nothing to write home about. It was quickly over though and I was soon walking the river road. I had entered the section of the Appalachian Trail maintained by John Perry, the gentleman I met at Ralph's Peak Hiker's Cabin Tuesday. I can see why he was so proud of it. The hordes of motorists who have only seen the river while battling traffic on the Connecticut Turnpike Bridge between Milford and Stratford, near its mouth, would not be able to recognise the river up here. 
Above that hideous massive power plant and the smoke belching factories, the upper river valley can be a magical place. This portion was a wide, shallow stretch of lazy blue curves flecked with small, lively rapids of foaming white and surrounded by quiet green woods. River Road was a gravel road running along the western bank of the Housatonic. After a mile, the road was gated and closed to vehicle traffic. That was the point where the original Appalachian Trail had crossed the river, passing over a bridge which was subsequently washed out in 1936, necessitating a relocation of the trail to a crossing further north. Since 1938, the Appalachian Trail has continued to follow the road north along the river. This was one of the more enchanting stretches of the Appalachian Trail, and it was very easy walking. The weather also cooperated. The few remaining clouds were tiny puffs of white in a bottomless, deep blue ocean of sky, and temperatures remained in the lower 60s this morning. I've always loved the Housatonic Valley, but after all the weed-choked, heat-blasted, parched landscapes I've encountered lately, it looked exceptionally lovely, sparkling in the sunshine. At one point early this morning, I passed round a bend in the road and came upon two white-tailed deer standing ankle-deep in the water at the river's edge, drinking. They were near the fringe of a handsome grove of dusky green pine, cobalt blue water swirling around their legs, sparkling with myriad white flecks of foam and golden sunlight. Partially submerged rocks on the shallow riverbed glittered like diamonds. I admired the tableau for perhaps 30 seconds before they noticed me and ran off into the woods, but the moment seemed suspended in time. The road continued through several plantations of towering white pines. The one tricky stretch of hiking was along the mile or so after the Appalachian Trail left the road and passed through dense concentrations of tall weeds in a riverside marsh. It could have been terrible, but John had done such a nice job of clearing the path that it was not too bad. The sights and sounds of the river in the cool, bracing air seemed unreal. A beautiful mirage conjured up by a psyche battered by days of merciless heat. At the end of River Road was a cold and excellent spring. Then the trail passed through several magnificent groves of hemlock and pine as it wandered over some low hills and through a small dark ravine on its way to US 7 at Cornwall Bridge. I crossed the river and arrived in that little New England village at 10.30 this morning, with eight miles already under my belt. A great mileage day looked to be shaping up, but it was not meant to be. The philosopher's guide said to stop in the package store at Cornwall Bridge and tell them that you're an Appalachian Trail hiker, so I did. The girl behind the counter handed me a register book to sign and a 25-ounce can of Foster's Beer, an Australian import, on the house, just for being a thru-hiker, loved and admired by all. I thanked her and headed next door to the deli, where I picked up a sub and a half pound of potato salad. I walked across the street to the village green, where I enjoyed my feast in the brilliant sunshine. Pete caught up to me there, and we had lunch together. By the way, thanks to all those stalls, restaurants and friendly picnickers in the central states of the Appalachian Trail, my weight has finally stabilised. You will remember that I started the Appalachian Trail on May the 3rd, 30 pounds overweight at 225 On June the 18th in Perrysburg, Virginia, I weighed in at 180, 15 pounds under my normal 195. I was beginning to wonder if I'd disappear before reaching Cadarden. Don't worry about that anymore. My weight stabilised around 175 a couple of weeks later and I'm now back up to 185. The way I've been eating, I might weigh 300 pounds but I'm not backpacking all these miles. I'm feeling stronger and healthier these past few days than at any other time on the trail. When my meal was finished, I pulled out the supply of cocktail peanuts, which I've been carrying lately for their high fat and salt content. They went great with the rest of that beer and added a classy touch. Just because one is backpacking the Appalachian Trail, one should not have to forego the little amenities. I didn't get away until one o'clock. There went the big day, but what the hell. The beer made me a little sluggish for the rest of the day after my nice little buzz wore off, but I was happy. The day remained cool, breezy and sunny with low humidity. It was a mid-August preview of a perfect New England autumn day to welcome back a wandering native sun. After a mile of road walking, the Appalachian Trail went into a dark entry ravine, ascending through the perpetual twilight silence of an old hemlock forest. Long years of decomposing fallen needles had buried the boulder-strewn ground and transformed it into a soft, lumpy carpet. It was lovely, even though the stream was barely running. I passed some old stone walls that were all that remained of an 18th century settlement named Dudley Town. The guidebook said that this community was made famous by the fact that it was suddenly abandoned for no apparent reason, a mystery to this day. Interesting. 
Above the ravine were some excellent views into Cornwall Valley, and the trail passed through an awesome forest of towering ancient hemlock known as Cathedral Pines a couple of miles later. In between was an attractive roadwalk through a high farming valley filled with fields of ripening corn and encircled by mountains. The Appalachian Trail ascended the slopes of Mohawk Mountain. It was a mixed experience. There were some superb viewpoints on the ski area, but we couldn't find the water pumps that were supposed to be at the picnic areas on the flanks of the mountain, and the spring at Red Mountain Shelter was bone dry. We finally found a nice running stream alongside US 4 about a mile later, where we sat down and made our dinners. Once again, we were going to have to make camp before we reached the next water, so we took care of dinner when water was at hand. There was a quick two-mile road walk before the Appalachian Trail climbed gradually up a ridge on an old dirt road which followed the route to an even older Indian trail. We pitched our tents at the edge of a farmer's field at eight o'clock. Just as I was crawling into my sleeping bag, the farmer's dog showed up. A small mixed collie with a big mouth, he stood about 200 yards away on the opposite end of the field and barked non-stop. We finally had to back up all our gear and leave just as darkness fell before the farmer showed up with a shotgun to shoot the trespassers. Luckily, we found a small flat clearing in the woods about a half mile further on. Even with the beer and all, I managed to hike 20 miles, so although my great mileage day went out the window, I had fun and still put in a good one. This is my second night on the trail in Connecticut, and I've been compelled to camp illegally both nights. It seems that just when it gets to be time to call it a day, the next legal campsite is always six or seven miles away. Oh well, that's just the wild, carefree, live-on-the-razor's-edge life of a thru-hiker. Oh, by the way, Crazy Charlie had signed in on the register at that package store in Cornwall Bridge Thursday night, after leaving Pete and me in Kent at three o'clock that afternoon. Package store closes at 8pm in Connecticut, so he must have either hiked more than 17 miles in less than five hours over a lot of steep, wet, tricky trail, or found an alternative means of travel. I think that closes the book on any possible doubts about Charlie. Have fun, we'll travel. <laughs>